Hello, and welcome to The Pillar Diaries, episode number eight, featuring Sister Olivia Hill. Sister Olivia has been a faithful member of the First Apostolic Church of Knoxville for 27 years, where she serves as the Assistant Sunday School Director. She currently works at the FAC Knoxville's Apostolic Christian School and is a certified nutritionist coach. She and her husband, Jeremy, have been married for 21 years, and they have two beautiful daughters, Giada, age 10, and Bianca, age 6. Sister Olivia's testimony will certainly challenge and change you. If you ever wonder if it really matters what you do for others, her testimony will show you just how powerful those acts of love truly are. If it's a hug after a service, a meal when someone's down, or simply a smile, we become His hands and feet. God has called us all to do many things, but first He calls us to love. These women are our pillars, and their stories are our monuments. If we ever fail to tell their stories, what they have built will crumble. These are their diaries. My name is Olivia Hill. I am 43 years old. I am married to Jeremy Hill. We have been married for 20 years. We've got a nine-year-old daughter named Giada and a six-year-old daughter named Bianca. And uh, I go to church at First Apostolic Church of Knoxville. And the Lord has been so kind to me. <laughs> so I was born in Knoxville. Um, I've lived here my whole life. I was born to two very young parents young teenage parents. Um, they had a whole lot of growing up to do themselves. Um, they had a lot of school to finish and then now they're going to have a baby to raise. And so with that, things just never really started off on the right foot with them. Um, they did decide to get married um, since my mom was pregnant, but through that, um, they really never found their way with one another and they never really found their way um, in creating um, the best home for me and my sister. Um, like I said, they were very, very young and early in their marriage, they did look to substance abuse. And so a difficult situation, um, that didn't help things. That took things, um, you know, just made it more chaotic, made it more hectic. Um, so it never really was a, a peaceful atmosphere. Now they, um, always provided for us. Um, they worked, they held jobs, we had food, um, clothing, a house, you know, we were always provided for. Um, I was never, you know, physically abused or sexually abused, you know, no, nothing like that, but there was uh, substance abuse really my whole life in our home. Um, they didn't do it in front of me, so I didn't have to, to see those things around the house, but I definitely felt the effects of that. So it was, um, you know, just a lot of turmoil really is the best way to put it. And just a um, kind of a fend for yourself type environment. So we would really come home from school and have our own business, so to speak. We would all just um, kind of go do our own thing around the house. Um, it wasn't, how was your day? And we're having family dinner together. We're watching TV together. There really just wasn't any of that. Um, I did have fantastic grandparents. Um, I would spend a lot of time at their house and um, they were always so sweet and so kind, but I really just thought that's the way things were is that you went to your grandparents and got a ton of ice cream. And then when you came home, you just retreated and did your, your own type of thing. And so that's really what I grew up with and that's all you know that I knew. And I didn't think that it was that unusual at the time. Um, and really that's kind of the way my house was um, all through growing up until I moved out when I was about 17 years old. Now I will say that my parents um, realized that there was some missteps um, and they, um, God has been good to restore a lot of things. Uh, my dad comes to church here at First Apostolic. Um, he's been coming for about 10 years and my mom watches online pretty regularly so you know God is good and he has been so good and and so kind to me but um, that's really kind of where I was coming from so my cousin um, went to a church and my grandmother went to that church and my cousin was was my age and like I said I was born to young parents so I didn't have a whole lot of cousins 
um, growing up, but I did have one cousin and she was a second cousin. And she would, um, her mom would bring her um, to the same church my grandmother went to. So we'd run around together a lot and she went to school at Apostolic Christian School. And she started probably in kindergarten going to school there and they would have Sunday school events and she would bring me with her sometimes because she didn't have any siblings, so she would bring me along with her. And I remember being, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, and I would come to Sunday school here at First Apostolic, and there was something that drew me to this church. And I didn't really know how to name it then. I didn't know what to call it then, but it just felt something inside my soul that I knew that I just loved coming and I would ask all the time, you know, can I come to church with you when you go to Apostolic? And my grandmother's church was a, was a great church. They were kind and sweet and um, I always felt real welcome there. But there was something when I came to church here that just felt different to me. And I see so many years later that, that this is home to me and this is where God wanted me to be. And He was placing that desire in my heart at such a young age. And I remember they would um, have like fun Sundays where you would get like play money. And I remember there would be like a house with dum-dum suckers and it would have like a little black dot on the bottom of it. And if you pick the one with the black dot, you won. And I just remember wanting to get that one with that black dot so bad. And you know, it just sticks out. And I mean, that was, you know, almost 35 years ago and I still remember it. And I can still feel it just like it was, was yesterday. And um, so I came just sporadically, maybe, you know, twice a year, three times a year, but any time that she would invite me to come, I would just, you know, ask my parents just over and over, please, can I come? Um, and they would let me. So I enjoyed being here what little bit I could. Um, so I went to public school and then I had just, I guess, just had it with going to public school. And I begged my parents and my grandparents um, to come to school at first at Absolute Christian School. And I begged them. And they probably thought, Lord child, you are so crazy because at my house, you know, we didn't we weren't spiritual. We didn't talk about we didn't talk about anything, but we definitely didn't talk about spiritual things. And um, they probably was wondering why I wanted so badly to go, but I did. And um, the Lord worked it out that I was able to go. Um, I, I'm sure, I, I don't know all the details, but I'm sure that my grandparents and my parents, you know, got the money together because we didn't have those kind of resources. Um, but they agreed to let me go, but I didn't have a ride. We lived about 20, a little bit over 20 minutes away from the church um, in the school. So it was, and I had a little sister, she had to get to school elsewhere. So they just, we just didn't have the means. And there was um, a lady named Sister Darlene Huffman, and she did not know me at all. Um, she, I'd never met her, but she lived close by, and I'll say close by as um, she had to drive down a path that was close to my side of town. Um, and she agreed to pick me up from school, or to pick me up and bring me to school, and to bring me home every day. And I would get dropped off at a gas station and she would pick me up at that gas station in the morning and I'd get in her van and uh, we'd come to school and then she would bring me home and drop me off at the gas station because it was along the, the path and one of my parents would come pick me up from there. And uh, she had two daughters um, that were close to me in age and she had a niece and uh, we'd get in that van and I laugh because Lord, four teenage girls in a van, um, and we had some crazy stories. You know, 25 minutes one way, um, we had some good times. But she didn't know. She didn't know what she was picking up. She didn't know what the Lord had in store for me, and neither did I. But I am so thankful. It really just, it changed the course of my life. It really did. And I've tried to thank her a thousand times over um, for what she did for me, because it was a sacrifice. You know, her girls would, that was back in the day, hot sticks. And uh, her girls would get in the van, they'd still have hot sticks in their hair. And it, it wasn't because they were running late. It was because they were making a sacrifice to come pick me up. And I am, you know, 25 years later, just so thankful. Um, 
that she was willing to do that. And I pray that, you know, her and her husband, Brother Richard, just receive all, you know, all that God has for them because of that, because it made such a difference to me. Um, you know, and it was, she wasn't preaching to me in the car, you know, if anything else, she was telling us to chill, to chill out, you know, hanging out the side of the van and carrying on acting silly. Um, but she showed me Jesus through the way that she, the way that she parented her girls, you know, the way that she, um, love them, the way that she would even correct them. You know, they'd get in the van and they'd throw their backpacks in the car and they would just start talking all about, you know, this is what happened today and this person did this and that person did that. And that was new to me, to hear that kind of exchange and that kind of dialogue. And um, and I started craving that and I, start, I started wanting that. And so um, it was, like I said, just an experience that I'm so thankful for. And I'm so glad she did that for me. Um, so I went to school all of 10th grade, and I would come to church when I could. Um, and then 11th grade, it just too many moving parts, and it didn't quite work out. And then um, 12th grade, I was able to drive, had my driver's license, had a car, and was working. And through those years of like 15 to, you know, the next five years on, it was really... Um, a lot of saints in this church that opened doors for me and taught me about Jesus. Um, and like I said, I had been to church before, so Jesus wasn't, the concept of Jesus wasn't new to me. This wasn't a whole new revelation of, oh, this is Jesus, you know, I, I knew. Um, but a different experience with Jesus, so to speak. Um, and it wasn't, I mean, it was my friends, but we're teenagers, we're kids, but it was their parents. And I could name, 25, 30 parents um, that just helped me and paved a way for me and just taught me Jesus. Um, they um, never treated me like an outcast. You know, I didn't look like everybody else. I didn't smell like everybody else. I didn't fix my hair like everybody else. I mean, I, I stuck out. I was different, but I never, I knew that, but I never felt that. They never made me feel that way. They never, I never felt like, well, you know, Livia can't come over here to our house. I never felt like a door was closed to me. I felt the opposite. I felt like the doors were always open to me. And I look back now as being a parent and I want to make sure that I'm setting that same example of, of keeping the door open because I so desperately needed that. And it was just them living life. You know, these were not folks that were out here just thumping Bibles and just, you know, preaching all the time. They were just living the Christian life, live in the Word of God. Um, we have great pastors here, the McCool family. They were just following under what had been preached and just living their lives. And, you know, I think back to um, a dear friend of mine. They lived in Oak Ridge, and I'd spend a lot of time out at her house. And her parents, um, strong apostolic folks, still are to this day. And um, her dad was pretty stoic, pretty reserved. And I remember going over there and I'd ask him the craziest off the wall questions. I'd say, you know, what if, this was when um, goth was a big thing. And uh, I'd say, what if your daughter wanted to wear all black clothes and, you know, she didn't change her appearance, but just everything else was black. And, you know, would, it, would you still let her come to church there? You know, and he would just laugh and and cut up and you know he would answer my question and he'd give me a godly answer um but he never got fed up and i would it got to be a joke you know where he'd start asking me crazy questions um and things like that but you know that could have been a time where he could have really laid the law down well in my house we don't do this and in my house we don't do that but he never treated me that way he took in all my questions and and answered them and we would drive in from Oak Ridge uh, to come to church from when I'd stay out there with them and that's another car ride. <laughs> you know, we didn't have electronics then, so it was just all kinds of um, just foolishness and carrying on, but they never got sick of it. You know, they never um, tried to push me away and I felt like the door was always open um, for me to, to go with them. And um, I have another friend and I'd go to her house and I remember going over there one day, I'd been over there several times, went back in her room and um, I went to shut the door behind us and she said we have to leave the door open and I said we have to leave the door open and she said yeah my mom and dad don't let me close the door 
And I thought, well, that's the wackiest thing I've ever heard of. Why can you not close a door in your own house? Because in my house, I mean, you just kind of went to your own space and did your own thing. And, um, you know, her mom didn't scream from the other room, don't shut your door. You know, it wasn't anything like that. And the daughter wasn't angry because she couldn't shut the door. And, um, you know, I later found out, well, that's because they want to keep communication open. They want to be able to talk and they don't want anybody just to retreat as a teenager back into your room and and not be able to talk. And so it's things like that, um, that they were showing me Um, just by living a godly life. And they did that over and over and over again. And I was just absorbing that and trying to take in just as much as I could um, through that. And I don't let my kids shut their door (laughs) today. I make them leave their doors open um, because I see where she was coming from on that. And it made total sense to me. Um, But these folks invested in me. And I think that that's so important and sometimes so overlooked. Um, Sometimes we think we come to church and we don't do a whole lot. Um, You know, I I might not serve in this capacity. Um, I may have a newborn and I can't do much or I may be elderly. But, you know, they took the time to invest in me. And um, a friend of mine, they um, lived in Clinton. Um, His mom still lives in Clinton. And she was, again, just open the door always um, to welcome me in. And now I see her at um, rallies and and things like that. And it's not a, hey, you doing all right kind of thing. I mean, it's get over here and give me a bear hug, you know, because she knew that at that young age what I needed. Um, And they never said it to me. We know you need this. But they just kept pouring into me um, through the years. And that just made this church more home to me. This became a home. It became a refuge. It became my place of safety and my place of love. And once I came, I was baptized. I received the Holy Ghost. I've never left. I have never left. Um, You know, we've had highs and lows and and been through things, but God has been so good to me, and and I've never left. Um, And I did meet my husband here. We got married real young. Um, He was 19 and I was 22. (laughs) So we had a whole lot of growing up to do ourselves. Um, Thank the Lord. We didn't have a baby to raise. We didn't have a baby to raise. But um, we had a whole lot um, of growing up to do. And his family, um, his mom and dad are divorced, but they both were apostolic and they both still attended church. Um, So while he didn't have a a perfect home, um, he had, you know, a lot of godly guidance. Um, And again, I had what I had just been recently learning and trying to apply, Um, but we got married and um, we had some tough, some tough years there because I didn't know how to be married. Um, And I think a lot of people can say that, well, I didn't know how to be married, but I knew that when he got home from work, oh, you're hungry? Okay. You know, make you do you baby, you know, kind of thing. And so um, it wasn't, um, and I didn't, I didn't think that I was doing anything out of the ordinary. Even though I had seen it in homes, I hadn't lived it. Um, And so those examples were still super valuable to me, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't what I had just lived day in and day out type thing. Um, So it took a lot of um, prayer. It took a lot of patience. Um, from Jeremy's part. And Jeremy has been, he is a very faithful, kind, um, gentle man. And um, he is steadfast and he he loves the Lord. He loves serving God and um, he sings at the church. And I would be hard pressed to find a time that he's ever complained about serving the Lord. He will come to hours of practices. He'll come help out. Um, And so thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord that he had that kind of love for not just Jesus, but had that kind of love for serving and for ministering. And it's not just when he was singing, it's ministry in any capacity. Anything that you'd ask him to do, he'd say, yeah, okay, I'll do it. Um, And like I said, I'd really be hard pressed to say that he ever complained about it. He, He just loved it. So we would be married, and I'd say, well, I'm not going to go to church tonight because, you know, uh, this eyelash is over here instead of over here. And he would be like, what are you talking about? And I'd say, well, I'm just not going to go to church tonight. And he'd say, well, you're going to miss it, and I'm going. 
And um, he would go without me because, I mean, he would tell me to come on and I'd say, well, I'm not going to go, you know, and uh, he would he would go on and then he'd come back and be in a good mood and I'd still be sitting there, you know, in my pajamas pouting on the couch about whatever it was. Um, but he, that was just his life. His life was, I'm going to go and um, I'm going to go where Jesus is and I'm going to serve and, and work. And so that just steadfast love and dedication was just preaching to me that um, and so it didn't take long before it was like we didn't have the discussion of are you going to church tonight we didn't really that didn't wasn't something we talked about you we just are we're going to church we're going to church all the time and now um, I mean it didn't take long before we just never here we go we're going to church um, so he was so patient and so kind and just such a good example of faithfulness um, to serving God and that helped um, out a whole lot and so we were married, or we are married, we were married for um, 10 years and we decided um, that it was time to have a baby. And that was a real tough decision um, for me to have a child. Um, like I said, growing up in a, a colder atmosphere, to be honest, I was terrified. And that's why we had waited 10 years and we thought, well, Lord, if we don't have a baby now, we're probably not going to have one. And we, and so um, we prayed about it. and. Uh, we said, all right, we'll see what God's will is. And um, God's will was we're going to get pregnant real quick. And so it was immediate, and um, I got pregnant, and I was scared to death. Um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I can't wait for this baby to come out. I was the opposite. I was like, when she comes, I don't know what I'm going to do. And um, I was terrified. It truly was. And everybody was so excited. We had so many friends here, um, had, you know, all these showers, and everybody was just finally, grandbabies coming. It was the first grandbaby for all of our grandparents, and they were so excited, and I was a nervous wreck inside. And so she came. <laughs> she didn't stay in. Um, she came. And um, I remember being home with her, and it was, we'd been home three days, and it was time. She hadn't had a bath yet. And um, I go to give her a bath and I just lose it. I just break down in tears and I said, Jeremy, I said, I don't know how to give this baby a bath. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what to do. And that's how I felt about everything. I just do not know what to do. And I wasn't afraid that I was gonna like drop her or anything like that, but I was so afraid of hurting her or making a mistake. And so I called a friend of mine who'd been a roommate and um, she goes to church with me and I called her and I said, it's, it's been three days, I'm going to have to give her a bath. And I couldn't even finish the conversation. I remember I gave the phone to Jeremy and before I knew it, she was knocking on my door and she'd come over to give my baby a bath and that doesn't sound like a big deal, but oh, it was such a big deal to me. And um, it was showing me Jesus, you know, showing me that she had a family at home. She had kids she was raising, and it was late. It wasn't like it was, you know, in the middle of the day, because, of course, I put it off all day long. But she dropped whatever she was doing, and she came over there, and she gave her a bath. She made it look so simple, you know, like, what are you talking about? It's like washing a dish or something, you know. And um, she got her all bundled up, and she stayed with me for a little while, and she just encouraged me and helped me. And it just goes back to the saints of this church just being there and just showing me Jesus time and time again. Uh, my daughter sat on her pew this morning. Um, you know, she's still here. She's still serving the Lord. Um, those are just things I'm so thankful for. Um, that same time, um, a friend of mine, she lives in Indiana now, um, but she lived in Knoxville and she said, I'm going to come down and take newborn pictures of uh, Giada and I said yeah sounds great we planned it months ahead because like I said everybody's so excited and yeah we'll do that well she makes a trip she gets to the door and I'm a wreck um, it was just too much for me um, and again I just still wasn't to the point to where I just felt nurturing and I felt like I had what it was going to take so I had really just kind of clocked out in a sense, like because I could I felt like I couldn't give what I needed to give, so I had just kind of clocked out on it. And this was real early. Um, when she was, you know, less than a month old. And so she came down from Indiana, she knocked on the door. I think I was probably in my pajamas and you know, she said, well, I'm here to do let's let's get your pictures done for her. And I said, you know, no, I I don't think I don't have anything ready. I don't have any clothes laid out. 
I, it was like she wasn't even coming, you know, and she's the best friend of mine. It wasn't like I was trying to mistreat her. I just wasn't there mentally. And uh, she said, well, let me come on in. And she came in and she was there for hours and she said, you're going to want these pictures. And she knew me and she had known me since I was 15. And she knew my desire and she knew what I wanted. And so she said, you're going to want these. And I said, I, I'll be okay. And she said, no, let's, let's get them done. And she spent hours there. And again, Jeremy was being so patient, came in. And I don't think I did anything. I think I just stood there while they took the pictures and got her dressed and undressed and, and all that stuff. But we've got the pictures. And, you know, they didn't just leave me high and dry because they knew what I needed when I needed it. And I am, again, just, God just orders every step. Um, he lays out before you what you need and who you need. Um, and he'll send things, people to give your baby a bath, people to take pictures. And that might not seem like a, a huge deal, but it was feeding my soul. And it was giving me the encouragement to say, we're behind you, Jesus is behind you. We can do this, You're, you can do this with Jesus. Um, we're here to support you. And that's really just always been what I felt. Um, and so we made it. <laughs> She's taking baths now. Um, so we've got her all uh, squared away. And so we decided we'd have another baby. I was obviously feeling real confident. Um, and so we did. We had another little girl. And um, during that time, um, you know, we were kind of rolling along. We found our groove a little bit. Um, we were, um, had the two children. And uh, I'd started doing something that, again, uh, was a big moment for me. So I'd say my first big moment um, was when I started coming to school here and then of course getting baptized and getting the Holy Ghost. And then this next moment came um, later. You know, I was in my mid-30s. Um, I worked a um, corporate job, had a house. Um, Jeremy's, you know, singing and working for the Lord. I'm doing um, Sunday school, teaching Sunday school. You know, we just kind of had a thing going. And um, a friend of mine had told me about ladies Bible study. She said, you um, should look into doing a, a ladies Bible study, like a formal Bible study. And I thought, okay, well, I'll give it a shot because I um, was just kind of searching for something additional. I was raising these children and I needed all the Jesus um, that I could get. And she, um, I got a book, it was a book on James. And I opened it up and I did the first lesson and I lost my mind in the best way. Jesus took me to a place that I can't even describe. It was like another layer had been pulled back. And uh, my mother-in-law lived next door to us. She lives next door to us. And she has, is a jewel of a lady. Um, she's been there for us so many times. My grandkids, or my kids, her grandkids, living next door to her. They love that. Um, she's so helpful to us. Um, so anyway, so. I went over there to her house to drop off uh, Bianca because she was going to babysit her while I worked. And um, I went and I just had tears streaming down my face. And I said, um, I've, I just did Bible study. And she said, okay. And I said, no, this was, this was different. This was different. And I said, you've got to get this book right now. And I mean, it's eight in the morning. <laughs> and she's probably thinking, Lord, you know, what are you, what are you talking about? Um, and it was just the way that it spoke to me. And I saw God more real than I had seen him um, before. And she got hooked on Bible study. So she does them all the time now too. And we always are talking back and forth about the different ones we're doing. But um, what I didn't know and I was just taking it all for me. You know, this is what God's got for me um, are these Bible studies. But he was preparing me because we were getting ready to go through a pretty big storm for us. Probably the biggest storm that we um, had ever been through. And he knew I needed the word. He knew that surface level was not going to take me, not going to get me through what I needed. That I had to have his word down into my heart. I'm, I was going to have to hold on to it with both hands, white knuckled, there for a few moments. And so, um, as I was doing ladies Bible study, I was just like a sponge, just soaking it up, soaking up every word that was in there, and learning so much about Jesus in a different way. And um, so, I'd been about two years into study. Um, my girls were getting older, and I. Um, got the news that my company, I worked for a corporation, that they were going to um, eliminate our entire department. 
And of course that sounds shocking, you know, and it sounds like, okay, well that's a big, oh, that's a big deal. And it was a big deal um, in the sense that it was a huge loss of income. Uh, you know, on paper, that the income part didn't make sense. If you put it down on paper, the pluses and the minuses, it just did not add up. There was just no way that that was going to make sense for me not to work. And um, I worked, like I said, a corporate job, so I traveled quite a bit. Um, I'd worked there for 19 years. I don't want to say that it was my identity because I don't want my identity to ever be wrapped up in a job. Um, I want it to be in Jesus, but this was a big piece of who I was and what I did. Um, and so they said, you've got three months and then we're going to eliminate your, your department. And um, so I prayed about it and I felt God really just impress on me, well, you're going to stay home and you're going to raise your girls. And I felt that one of the strongest things I've ever felt him impress upon me. And um, I said, okay, that sounds, you know, that sounds okay. And then I felt it again. And when I felt it again, I shared it with Jeremy and I said, this is what I feel like, like God is saying. And he said, well, all right. And um, he said, we'll just pray about it and see. And uh, like I said, I had three months there to decide what I was going to do. And every time I would try to apply for another job, I would get sick. I would get nauseous. I would almost throw up. And um, there was one within my company that I applied for, and um, it went, it should have worked out, but it didn't. And the door was shut. It, sh it should have been just a no-brainer. And the door was shut, and then every time after that, it was just, I would just get sick. I couldn't even fill out an online application. I would just start to almost vomit. I'd get so sick from it. And so Jeremy said, well, this is what we're going to do. And I thought at first, okay, well, that sounds all right. We, I'm going to stay home because I'd been traveling quite a bit. You know, I'd prepare meals a week in advance for everybody. Um, you know, I'd have people, uh, my mother-in-law would watch my girls while Jeremy worked. You know, we had all these schedules and everything all planned out. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll stay home and raise these girls. God, I appreciate that. Thank you so much for letting me do this. It's going to be great. We're going to do, you know, we're going to do all kinds of arts and crafts and that kind of thing. And um, so that's how I envisioned it um, in the moment and then um, I quit or you know my they was here and so the job was gone and I stayed home and it didn't take long before God I, it didn't take long before I hit a real uncomfortable place because I had never stayed at home with my girls I'd never I mean, let's just call it what it is. I've never been a full-time mom like that. I've never had them with me all the time. Um, and that was real hard for me. That was real, real hard for me. I, up until that point, had tried to raise them as best as I knew that I could. And I wanted them to serve the Lord so badly. And I wanted to teach them how to serve the Lord. And I wanted our home to be loving, um, to be warm. And I felt like it was. But after about two weeks being home with them, I was at my wit's end. And I loved them to death, but I, had, I didn't know how to do this full time. I, I, you know, I knew how to organize meetings and, and do conference calls, but I didn't know how to just be with them one-on-one -on -one for eight and 10 hours a day. That was new to me. And um, I struggled a whole lot with that. I felt lonely and um, just unsure. And that's when I would go, get back into my ladies' Bible study every day. I'd get up early. I'd get up 5 o'clock, you know, and I knew I'm getting up at 5 o'clock and I'm going to be with my children until 5 o'clock, 8 o'clock that night, you know, till Jeremy got home. So getting up earlier just meant a longer day. But I needed the Word of God to guide me through that. I needed that Bible study. I needed Him feeding me. And so... Um, it was chaotic there for a little bit. Um, I wasn't bringing my A game at all, but I didn't know how to do it. I, I mean, I had been a mother, but not like that. I didn't know how to do it. And so I went back to what God had taught me over the years, where I'd always gotten my guidance from, of course, Him, but also saints in the church to help me. And I reached out to two ladies. Um, they both happen to homeschool. One, one goes to church here with us and one um, goes to church in um, Indiana. And 
I text them both. They homeschool their kids or or good kids. You know, they've got a good track record going for them. They have several children and um, they're godly women. And so I want to say that that's how I kind of pick them to go to. I prayed about it. Um, Both of these women serve in the church actively. Um, They both post positive godly things on social media. Um, They both bring their families to church, you know, and so I felt like I could go to them and just be real raw and real honest. And I um, called one in tears and I said, I don't know what to do. I have no clue what I'm doing here. And I feel like I'm starting to lose my grip on what I'm doing. And um, she was so kind. She guided me. She said, well, let me give you some, some resources. And so the next thing I knew, my phone's flooded with links and resources and she'd send me letters in the mail and she would check on me and I would um, come to church and she'd come straight to me and try to help me take jackets off and just things like that and again just showing me God showing me you know um, we you can do this um, and it wasn't just a, a pump you up you, you can do this you've got this it was showing me through God this is what his word says. And she came from a difficult place and she had to, she said, you know, I went through a lot of this myself. And, and so um, that helped tremendously, tremendously. It helped me so much. And um, I would text my other friend that lives in Indiana and I'd say, you know, I, I'm not feeling real good today and I'm tired. And should I punish my child this way? And I wasn't asking for every time I turned around, but you know, when I was exhausted and just couldn't couldn't do it anymore she would say okay well let's take a breath and and tell me the situation you know she had you know five kids to raise on her own she could have just been like I'm sure it'll be fine you know but she didn't she stops and texts me back and walk me through the situation and what's going on and let's talk about this and so those two ladies were there for me a whole lot um, just encouraging me and helping me and again never judgment and um you know, helping me get through all of that. So that's not been that long ago um, that we went through that. But God had to, for me, He knew the desires of my heart to raise my girls in truth, to raise them in love, um, not just bring them to church, but be with them in church. You know, I want them to love the Lord. I want them to know how good and how kind He is. And it's a little bit different for me because it wasn't difficult for me to accept Jesus because I needed everything that he had to give. But I don't know how to raise girls who don't know any different. You know, they have never missed, I mean, except being sick, but they've never, this is home to them. They don't know any different than just church, in and out, mom and dad serving. Um, And so I'm like, well, how do I raise them to know Jesus? Because they don't have necessarily a negative experience that they're coming from um, because they really don't know anything about any of that. Um, you know, they love their grandparents all the same and they don't know any, they don't know um, that it was different for me growing up. And so how do I raise them when all they know is God's goodness? And so it was so important to me and it still is that I want to make sure that they know to not take this for granted, to not take this truth for granted, to not take Jesus for granted, His love and His mercy. So God had to remove the distractions for me of my job. And it was tough financially. Like I said, I don't want to overlook that because God has more than provided um, for us in those in that situation. I mean, again, even when you put pen to paper, it doesn't make sense. I, Jeremy and I sometimes look at it and we say, how'd this work? Because it just doesn't seem to make sense. But um, he had to remove that so I could get down to the nitty gritty because I don't think I would have ever got to the nitty gritty. And now looking back, I think I would have gotten to them being older and I would have scratched my head and said, what didn't I do that I needed to do? And I would have been disappointed. I know I would have been disappointed because I look back and see when they were real young, the difference. Um, And I'm not saying that you have to be a stay at home mom to raise godly children. Don't hear me say that because that's not the case. Um, But that's what I needed. I needed to be stripped down. I needed to be confronted with what I didn't know how to do and let God show me how to do that. And I think He is. I know He is showing me how. Um, I do work at the school here at Apostolic, um, but I've been blessed to be able to work just the hours they go to school. And I feel, I feel like that honors what God said to stay home and raise them because when they're home, I'm home. And we're home um, together a lot. And it's just 
God has birthed something in me as a mother and I know he has a plan for those girls. And if it took that for me to get them to their plan, that's what I wanna do. Um, I wanna do everything I can to make sure that we all make it and that they're soul winners and are bringing other folks you know, with them to the truth. I would say the most rewarding part of living for God is to see the changes that He has made in me, but the, also that He can make in others. Um, there are so many times where um, I've sat on the pew and I've looked around at people like during praise and worship service and I see them praising and I, I know what they've been through and I know what road they've walked. Um, you know, cancer, broken marriages, um, miscarriages, loss of a spouse. I see what they've what they've gone through and what God has brought them through. And that to me is so rewarding to see that, I, you know, I feel like God is so personal to me and He is, but then when I see He's doing the same thing for this person and for that person, that He loves so, He loves us all and He's willing to be so kind to all of us, it just blows my mind. And that to me is the most rewarding thing that for me, that almost is, encourages me just as much as God doing something for me is what, when I see Him doing things for other people because it just reminds me that He is constantly working. Um, he's always doing miracles. And the fact that He can be so personable to so many people, um, it just energizes me and it makes me want to just tell more people about Him. And when I see you know, somebody come in or a visitor come in, I just want them to feel so welcome and so at home and so you know, just come in here because I want them to be like, listen, it won't be long before you'll see what God's got for you and the reward is outstanding. And um, I think that's just the biggest reward of serving Jesus is just seeing how He works in such different ways and such mighty ways. I don't think that I could pick one person that's been the most influential to me, the, uh, one lady that's been the most influential. I would say that there's probably a hundred women um, that I could pick, and that starts um, with the leadership of our church um, and then just expands from there. Because there's been different seasons in my life where somebody has spoke to me from this church um, and just from our district and just within or anybody I've come in contact with. So I'd say that every person that has, you know, given me a hug, that's given me advice, that's welcomed me in their home, um, that's let me sit at their table, you know, those are the women that have influenced me, the ones who didn't turn me away or, or didn't judge me, um, the ones, like I said, that helped me take my kids' jackets off or wipe the spit off my back when I'm running in the door. You know, those are my influences because that's what it takes to help others and to build a church is it takes all kinds of people and it's not one person's influence that has just resounded in my ears over and over it's been a collection of ladies and I'm so thankful for each and every one of them I go back to say that this church is home for me um, this church has always been warm to me. It's always been welcoming to me. I mean, like I said, I can go back to say eight or nine years old and still feel what I feel today. And there were so many times um, that I would come into the church and it was just a sigh of relief. Um, coming from chaos, um, maybe coming from chaos when I lived at home or coming from where I felt like I wasn't meeting what I needed to do at home. It was like if I could just get to church um, and it was a release. I could just sit down and breathe. And I think it's so important to keep the church the church, to keep the church home. And what I mean by that is that every person, um, you know, if you're attending church, serve. Um, serve in some capacity. Um, if you're serving is just by being a, a big worshiper, just worship, just show up, just be here because you want to keep home, 
the home fire's burning. You want to keep this place, this tabernacle, you want this to be home because there's going to be people who come in who maybe haven't been here in five years, 10 years, 30 years. And when they come back, my biggest piece of advice is when they come back, make it feel like home. Make it look like home. Make it sound like home. Um, preaching the truth, preaching the gospel, encouraging um, people that come in the door. You know, there would be times where it was like, if I could just get to Jesus, if I could just get to the church, it's almost like in the Bible where it talks about um, if I could just touch the hem of his robe. And there were so many times where just getting my feet into this building was like touching the hem of his robe. His robe. I was just getting to Jesus. Um, and I think that's so important that we've got a place where people can connect and can get to Jesus. You know, Paul talks about in the Bible, you'll hear Paul in almost every one of his letters talk about his friends, right? He talks about who encourages him. And when he writes his letters, send my regards to this person and that person. Because he knows when he comes back through that city, he expects to see them there. He expects that they're going to be ministering. He has no other um, expectations of them. You know, send my, send my regards and give them you know, a hug, because uh, I know they're doing the work of the Lord. And he knew that when he came back, that's what he would see, and that's what he wanted to see. And I think that's what God wants from us, is he wants us to keep the church going. He wants us to hold strong to what we've been taught, to holiness, to baptism in Jesus' name. And so that when somebody comes in, um, I've even adopted the phrase, um, we had somebody that came in and they've not been here in about 10 years, and I said, welcome home. And they literally just kind of let out a breath. They said, it's good to be home. And that's how I feel about it. And I think that we can't get sidetracked with so many other things that we forget to keep home, home. Um, it's important. Um, I remember that um, when I was going through something, there would be a lady, um, a friend of mine, um, his mom and dad have guided me through so many things and um, she knew that there was times I was just getting in that door and she'd see me head to leave out the door and she'd stop me and she'd say, you doing all right? You doing okay? You gonna make it? I'm gonna see you next time. And she would tell me, um, we're gonna see you next time. We're gonna see you next service. You know, and it was just that. It wasn't hitting me over the head. It, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, an expectation it, in that way of like you're going to disappoint me it was like we can't wait till you come back and um, you know I think that that's so important and we should never overlook the importance of just keeping the home ready for those that want to come back